probably what is arguably the most important thing we're going to figure out tonight. All those in favor of TCU, raise your hand. <laughs> and the Georgia Bulldogs. And it looks like TCU is the uh, looks like TCU is the favorite. They are down seven to zero though, so don't know how that's going to work out for you. All right, this is a hybrid meeting of the city council. Members of the public can view this meeting live on Channel Eight, the city's website, and YouTube. Live Spanish translation services are being provided for tonight's council meeting by telephone. Please dial seven two zero three eight six nine zero two three and use code one zero four zero nine one star. Se ofrecen servicios de interpretación en español para esta reunión del Consejo Municipal por teléfono. Marque el número 720-386-9023 y utilice el código 104091 estrella. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. City Clerk is the host of the Zoom meeting. Speakers will be able to unmute themselves when recognized. At this time, we'll call the special meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Mayor Heisman. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Alan Thomas. Present. Council Member Madera. Present. Council Member Noble. Present. Council Member Hurst. Present. Council Member Kim. Mayor. Council Member Ford. Mayor. Council Member Douglas. Present. Mayor Heisman, you have a quorum. Thank you, and we are all present and accounted for, aside from the one vacancy. We're gonna move on to ordinances on first reading. We have ordinance 2451, which is authorizing a bear cap purchase for the police department. Do any council members have any questions for staff regarding this ordinance? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion and a second to introduce ordinance 2451 by council as seated and approved on first reading. Mayor Pro Tem. So moved. Council Member Ford. I have a motion and a second to introduce ordinance 2451 by council as seated and approve on first reading. Is there any discussion? All right, before we vote, I'd just like to thank all the uh, officers for the in the Commerce City Police Department, past, present, and future. Today is Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. We appreciate everything you do for our community, as well as all the other officers across this great nation and across the, the globe that uh, do everything they can to protect residents in their communities. Thank you for your service. Will the clerk please read the title and take a roll call vote. Ordinance 2451, an ordinance amending the 2023 budget of the City of Commerce City, Colorado by appropriating a portion of the unencumbered fund balance to the Fleet Management Fund and transferring portions of the unencumbered fund balances in the police forfeiture federal and police forfeiture state funds to the Fleet Management Fund to be used for the purchase of a bear cat for a total amount of $280,000 and the authorization of the expenditure thereof. Your vote is open. And Council Member Kim? Aye. Motion's gonna carry unanimously eight to zero. I'm also gonna take this time to mention the fact that Council Member Kim's uh, bed corners are not at a 45 degree angle. Yeah. I hope that he'll rectify that in the near future. All right, moving on to admin business. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen for Black History Month, I'll invite Mayor Pro Tem Alan Thomas to discuss the item and make a motion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, February is Black History Month, and it's we were just notified last month that one of the commission members for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commissions um, found out that the Tuskegee Airmen can come to our city, and we want to make it a big special event for the whole um, city. And the cost to come to the city is $1,500, and the date is to be possibly scheduled on February 23rd. Uh, this is something, like I said, our city manager, uh, Jason Rogers, is aware of, and city staff is already aware of the situation as well. And um, we, like I said, want to make it a big event and welcome the entire Commerce City. We're planning to have something here at the Civic Center building. And one of the Tuskegee Airmen is still living. Um, he's 100, 100 years old, and hopefully he'll be able to attend this event as well. So I want to make a motion to for the city to city staff to move forward to explore that idea, um, like I said, on February 23rd, and give $1,500 to have the Tuskegee Airmen present here on February 23rd. All right, I have a motion for the city to spend $1,500 for the purpose of bringing the Tuskegee Airmen to Commerce City on February 23rd and direct staff to move forward with everything associated with that. Councilmember Kim? 
Second. Have a motion and a second to spend the $1,500 and direct staff to move forward with that for them to visit the city on February 23rd. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously, eight to zero. All right. You guys want to do the URA meeting now? I'm going to move on to the Ward 3 vacancy presentations. I'll ask the city clerk to outline the, present, the process tonight for filling the vacancy. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council. Tonight you have six candidates for the Ward 3 vacancy uh, in front of you tonight to do oral presentations. So per Council Policy 21, and in accord with Section 4.5 of the City's Charter, and not less than 10, no more than 30 days after the vacancy occurs on the City Council, Council shall appoint an eligible person to fill such vacancy to serve until the next organizational meeting of the City, which would be uh, shortly after the November 2023 election this year. Um, that vacancy was declared by City Council at the December 19th, 2022 meeting, which means Council has to fill this vacancy by January 18th, 2023. Um, the notice went out to the public uh, within 48 hours after the vacancy was declared by City Council and a set of uniform questions were attached to the vacancy notice and to the resolution Council adopted uh, outlining the questions Council would like to ask of applicants. Applicants uh, were required to submit their applications by January 4th at 5 p.m. and like I said you received six applicants for tonight's vacancy. Uh, each applicant will have five minutes to provide a verbal presentation before council. At the conclusion, council will uh, have a 30 minute reception out in the atrium with the public, the candidates and city council to meet and greet the uh, applicants. Upon conclusion of the reception, council will uh, reconvene the special meeting to begin voting for the applicants. Uh, council can, on the first ballot, choose to identify your top three candidates, and then from there we will do successive rounds of voting on those candidates. After each round of voting, the candidate with one or fewer votes will be eliminated until council has a five-vote majority for a candidate. Council can modify at any time the procedure of filling the appointment, uh, such as conducting a runoff vote, appointing anybody eligible to serve that did not submit an application to uh, decide the vacancy by either a coin flip, drawing of lots or other method, or um, establish a nominating committee to provide a non-binding recommendation for the city council or any other method that council so chooses to fill the vacancy with. With that, are there any questions for me at this time? Perfect, thank you. All right, we're gonna give each applicant five minutes to speak. We're gonna go in the order of when their submission was received by the city clerk's office. So we'll start with Michael Sterosum. Your microphone's right here. You have your timer right there. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank the city council for the time. I didn't know I was the first applicant to put up forth. Um, so I'm a little surprised to be up here first. I figured I'd get a little template from other users, but not users, but other applicants themselves. Use the term users because I'm an IT professional. I work for the city of Aurora's um, city hall. Um, I work for the mayor's office as well as the police department and fire department over there. Um, I'm the IT, I work as the senior systems admin engineer over there. And uh, I get a general idea of how certain things work in the government over there, at least. Um, and I'd like to lend, throw my hat in the ring to be able to have uh, a seat with your fine board here and um, possibly represent my city because I do live here, been living here for about five and a half years. Before that, I was living in North Glen, and I had a house in North Glen, as well as in Westminster. Um, I, don't, I don't have any kind of background in law or anything that has to do with city council. I just have um, some values that I was raised with from my parents, and uh, they believed in giving back to the community and serving the community that you live. So that way you could make it a better place to live and uh, establish some certain um, finer points or 
um, positive uh, things that may have happened at some other communities that I lived in that could apply here. Uh, I'm not that very eloquent in talking. I'm very good at, talk, at writing and thinking. Um, I have a, a lot of logic in my background, and I would like to apply some certain things I've learned in, from living in other states and other communities to apply here if, if it's uh, suitable for the city council and for our community. Um, it's about all I have. I'll keep it quick, short and sweet. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Appreciate your application and you being here to speak with us. We're going to move on to Melinda Larson. Uh, good evening and thank you for your time tonight. My name is Lindy Larson and I'm applying to fill the Ward 3 Council vacancy. I trust you've had a chance to review my application, but I wanted to take a few minutes to tell you more about myself, my qualifications, and my vision for the community. I married my college sweetheart more than a decade ago, and we have three children. He has served the communities of Broomfield and North Glen as a firefighter and paramedic for 13 years. We moved from Thornton to Commerce City five years ago in pursuit of more space and fresh views. Almost from day one, I wanted to learn more about city operations, including utilities, special districts, volunteer opportunities, city government, and the local school districts. I began by joining my HOA committee in 2018 and was elected president in 2020. A passion sparked early on to serve my community that only grew deeper the more I understood the community level operations. The passion, this passion prompted me to pursue election to my Metro District Board, as well as appointment to the city's Quality Community Foundation and Environmental Policy Advisory Committee. Simply put, I have fallen in love with the groups I serve through these ventures. I consider myself lucky to be entrusted with approximately $240,000 to allocate to both nonprofits and need-based scholarship recipients. Notably, $100,000 of that was raised by the QCF in collaboration with the Commerce City Police Department. I'm honored to work with some of the brightest people in my area to manage the combined debt of two neighborhoods totaling $8.5 million to the high level of fiscal responsibility that our residents expect. And I'm proud to say that we've been able to achieve and maintain a flat tax for our community, our residents, one that remains below the national inflation rate. I am immensely optimistic at the improvements coming to our city as a result of the work that has been done by the EPAC to investigate environmental impacts and brainstorm a variety of mitigation responses. And I'm humbled when I think of the opportunities I've had through my HOA to work, to, to work with people who are struggling in my neighborhood and show them compassion, empathy, and respect while identifying uh, workable and mutually agreeable solutions. The years spent on those four committees and boards has provided me with knowledge, experience, perspective, and most of all, the understanding that all it takes to impact a community for the better is a collection of committed and driven individuals who are dedicated to identifying common ground and capitalizing on shared goals. So much of what I want as a resident of Commerce City is echoed by the 60,000 other individuals who call the city home. We want clean and palatable drinking water healthy air for our kids to breathe while they ride bikes and walk to school, and safe communities in which residents take pride in their heritage as well as the neighborhoods in which they reside. We want a police force that is empowered to protect us and humbled to serve us. We need a variety of shopping and dining options from retailers who are invested in our community and who are proud to run businesses in Commerce City. And as Coloradans who recognize the inherent dignity of each human being, we want to partner in the growing movement to address increasing rates of poverty, homelessness, and mental health concerns through common sense and targeted approaches. I have had the, opportunity, or the honor excuse me, to become acquainted with many of the local nonprofits leading this effort via the grant allocation process of the Quality Community Foundation. Commerce City is making fantastic strides toward becoming a city that prioritizes the health, safety, and well-being of its residents above all else and has immense potential truly a quality community for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your application for being here to speak with us this evening. Next up is Cassie Ratliff. I want to thank the council and mayor for this opportunity to speak to you all tonight and for all the city employees who helped pull this together. 
My husband and I moved to Commer City just over nine years ago. We wanted to be closer, closer to my oldest daughter's school and moved to a community that was energetic and supportive of its neighbors. I was a month away from delivering my twins and we purchased our first home. I'm grateful to have purchased this home when I did because unfortunately now, if we wanted to buy, we would not be able to do so in our neighborhood. We have been priced out. I know many of us here in this room and online um, have had similar experiences. Many of us cannot afford to live where we work. Affordable and safe housing continues to be a need and priority for all people in our community. Along with barriers to obtaining affordable and safe housing, many of our community members have experienced food insecurity, employment challenges, limited access to health care, and exposure to harmful chemicals in our water and air. It's even more concerning that these issues disproportionately impact our BIPOC communities. It is imperative that our council consider equity in all of its decision making and recognize that representation matters. As a leader in the nonprofit world, I have learned to really evaluate intentions and the actual impact we are having because too many times these do not line up. It is my intention to serve this city with the hopes of seeing our neighbors and community thrive. Leadership is not always about you doing the work, but helping identify the right people at the right time, stepping aside and letting those with the most skills, knowledge and passion lead the way. And if I am being truly intentional in my service to this community I, and want to see the greatest impact, I must do just that. I humbly withdraw my application for Ward 3 City Council and encourage this community, this council to vote for Renee Chacon. She has the energy we need, she has the skills necessary to move the needle on equity in our city, and she represents the voice of those who cannot speak up. I again thank you for your time and encourage you to vote for Renee and consider this my withdrawal. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate you being here this evening. Next will be Ashley Jackson. Appreciate it. Just Bless you. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman and Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be here today. My name is Ashley Jackson. I grew up in a small town in Missouri. Growing up, my family always served for our community. I come from a military family. I resided in Commerce City for seven years now. I am a mother of three beautiful children, and I am married to a police officer who has served for our community for 17 years now. I believe I have the experience, the knowledge, the leadership skills, hard work ethics, passion, and dedication to serve for a community in this capacity. My passion and drive come from both professional and personal experiences. I have been in insurance, real estate, management, and have started my own business ground up. In insurance, I directed marketing strategies and analyzed detailed insurance companies. In real estate, I have a was a transaction coordinator processing million of dollars a year. In management, I accomplished department objectives by managing staff, planning, and evaluating department activities. I started my own photography business with my daughter that I am passionate about and hope to one day pass down to her. I am involved in a local high school and volunteer my time to help with planning school events, team dinners, banquets, and capturing special moments of the students and share them with the school paper and the parents of the community. I am also on my homeowners association and do all the planning for the community events like the Easter egg hunt, Santa visiting neighborhood, movie park, and many other social events. I have served on our board for six years and we have accomplished a lot of good things for our community. I have been involved in projects costing up to $200,000 and have helped draw up the plan and budget the community each year. Commerce City is a beautiful city with great potential but has the unique challenges for growth. Sometimes growth can be painful, but with proper planning and foresight, it can have a positive impact that we can all embrace. I am excited for all the changes and challenges that the city faces. I believe in promoting the economy to ensure that Commerce City remains competitive with sound businesses that bring value to the city and its residents. A strong, stable economy that isn't just dependent on a few businesses, but a variety of small businesses that engage and bring value to the community. It is important that we attract these businesses with resources and tax incentives to ensure that we give and thrive and grow. 
The infrastructure must be maintained, improved, and built into the needs of the community, making sure our roads, transit, transit systems, water pipes, waste facilities, and parks, just to name a few, are all working properly and are equipped with channel of the growth. Maintaining and building the systems and allow the city to expand and attract more businesses and tourists to our city. I believe the current resources for health, safety, education is strained. Improving areas such as medical options, as access to health care and policies that benefit the public concerning health care can be improved. Residents want to feel safe in our community. The safety of our community is dependent on the public servants, the educators, and planning for businesses that promote a healthy, vibrant community. We want to ensure that they are safe outlets in our community, such as parks and gathering areas, such as downtown. I believe in engaging with our police officers, firefighters, healthcare workers, and other emergency workers to ensure that they have the resources they need to help with our community. I know being a council member can face challenges, challenges that us as a community can solve together. I want to be the voice of the community and support hardworking people and families that help navigate the issues that impact us all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your application for being here to speak with us this evening. Next is gonna be Renee Miller Chacon. Hello. Klaso kamati umeto, klaso kamati atatonati, klaso kamati tonantik leli, klaso kamati abuelitos y abuelitas and all the ones that came before and all the little ones to come. My name is Renee Malar Chacon. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to apply for this vacancy. We live on the land of the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Shoshone, the Kiowa, and 48 tribes that still live and travel through this space. And I ask you to keep this in mind because Commerce City Council has never had an indigenous representative on my homelands. My family has been here for generations before Colorado was even a state, and we can name landmarks, parks, and locally spaces that are not even named our indigenous names anymore. These cultural contexts, this trauma sensitivity, and this work is long overdue for in communities that still survived forms of genocide. Most of all, I am a mother. I do work in this space for environmental justice. I was appointed on the Environmental Justice Action Task Force, so 11 months work that we, nominate, that we gave recommendations to the governor for environmental justice actions from best practices to cumulative impacts. I was the co-chair for the equity analysis subcommittee with Beatriz Soto so that we could actually represent disproportionately impacted communities, embedded communities, and most of all, equity priority communities, especially in spaces here like Commerce City. My family has been in Commerce City for generations. We have actually been fighting spaces before it was Suncor, it was Conoco. And it was because we have suffered from particulate pollutants. In fact, I have anemia that is not genetic. My son now suffers from nosebleeds. For nine years, I was with my husband, who was a nuclear engineer for the Navy, from all the way down from South Carolina up to Maine, Oregon, down to San Diego, where I ended up being an ombudsman. I earned my master's in educational leadership and administration, and I started a nonprofit, Women from the Mountain, with my prima, my cousin, Micaela Ironshell Dominguez of Standing Rock, who was founded and won a Human Rights Award for the International Indigenous Youth Council of Standing Rock, where we sent 3,000 veteran support to Standing Rock to support that space and understand what does equity, priority, and sovereignty really mean for communities. Most of all, I change and I want to change the status quo. We cannot accept business as usual anymore. We have had communities in commerce cities and for generations, which is a port city. I've lived in port cities, especially as a Navy wife, and understanding that our community is not properly represented in this space. Public health and safety is an issue, and it is a number of cumulative impacts from lessened affordable housing when we have 50% of populations, privatized school districts, which are legitimately cutting off our future generations into new sectors, such as new job trades as EV vehicles, and especially in Commerce City, again, where it's a port city, is recognizing that we can work with new and incentivizing new sectors with cultural sensitivity and trauma sensitivity to come into our spaces and actually help our communities directly by prioritizing those that have been harmed the most and being a model to what not just climate justice looks like, but equity priority will finally look like in a space called Commerce City. Before that, it was Commerce Town. Before that, it was Irondale. Before that, where we live now is Henderson. Commerce City was founded by the KKK. We need to recognize that this is long overdue equity. Our communities still live here, very much know the history, and we can bridge our cultural education to future generations and understanding what does equity actually look like. I stand here as a teacher, as a mother, 
as yes, a founder of a nonprofit, and most of all, as now a living ancestor. I ask all of you to understand that every one of your decisions, we might call it budgets or so what so have you, is actually a decision for our future generations and we need to weigh them with the type of sensitivity and compassion that it takes, which is actually responsibility. Our, yes, our earth can go on, but it is legitimately our job to steward it with responsibility now. And unfortunately, our past generations have not done that or I wouldn't be standing here with anemia. We need to be mindful about what it actually looks like to prioritize our communities, have that representation there, and most of all, work with a sensitivity that's never been in state and federal agencies before. That is what I learned on the Environmental Justice Action Task Force, working with sectors, including those that we don't always get along, but we did agree in understanding what it meant for future generations in surviving now, and I ask that you keep this in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your application for being here to speak with us this evening. Last but not least, Jose Guardiola. <clears throat> Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor and members of City Council. Again, I want to thank you guys for this second opportunity to be appointed on the City Council. Um, you know, again, I think my history in Carmel City since 1983 as a son of immigrant parents coming from Mexico to establish their family and the American dream here in Carmel City shows the experience and my journey to come here, right? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I believe this appointment should be is someone that has that experience. It's a 10 month appointment and I thank you guys for going from three, month, three years to 10 months because I believe the Ward 3 residents should decide who they get to sit for the next two years. Um, and picking me and my experience coming is we're hitting the ground running. We're hitting the ground running, getting things moving. There's no learning curve. There's no orientation. It's starting and going. And I think that our Ward 3 residents deserve that. You know, I look and I, and I appreciate everybody that was here today because everybody brings their own expertise and their passion and their dedication. And <clears throat> most of you guys know me, have worked with me in a number of uh, occasions um, other than Council Member Kim, but my passion and my dedication is in my application, it's in the phone calls, it's in my heart, and I think, I hope, this council that's seated could put their personal biases against me and do what's right for Ward 3 and the residents. Put their political biases against me and put the residents of Ward 3 their priority because that's what our city needs. And I hope that whoever they pick represents, I've been a, a Ward re resident for 12 years now, but Karma City resident since 1983. And I appreciate your guys' time I know it's not easy, like the mayor said, TCU in Georgia, big game, but I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your application for being here. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite all the applicants, the public and council to the atrium for a 30-minute meet and greet. We're going to reconvene this meeting after the URA meeting, which will start at 7 p.m. And once the business of the URA concludes, then we'll reconvene the city council meeting and move on with the selection process to fill the Ward 3 vacancy. So at this time, we are in recess.
All right, Mr. Aiken, you want to know the score now? No, please. <laughs> I see those hospital corners still aren't at 45 degrees. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Give me a break, it's been years. <laughs> you are kind of old, right? Mayor, when I was your age. <laughs> I can't talk. You're the one still out doing half tries. All right, it is 7 p.m., so we're gonna get the URA meeting underway. At this time, we'll call the meeting to order. Ask the secretary to call the roll. Chair Huseman. Present. Vice Chair Allen Thomas. Present. Commissioner Madera. Present. Commissioner Noble. Present. Commissioner Hurst. Present. Commissioner Kim. Present. Present. Commissioner Ford. Present. Commissioner Douglas. Present. Commissioner Tedesco. Present. Commissioner Boucher. Present. Commissioner Mashuga. Present. Commissioner Lovato. Present. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. This time I'm looking for a motion and a second to excuse the members not present. Mm, Vice Chair. So moved. Commissioner Hurst. Second. I have a motion and a second to excuse the members not present. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. However many people are here with the however many absences we have. Next up, we're going to go to the minutes. I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Vice Chair? So moved. Commissioner Ford? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. We're gonna move on to resolutions. Uh, resolution URA 2023-03, an agreement of professional services with Economic and Planning Systems Incorporated. Do any board members have any questions for staff? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion and a second to adopt resolution URA 2023-03. Vice Chair? So moved. Commissioner Madera? Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution URA 2023-03. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Noble. Um, thank you very much. I was hoping that um, we could have a, a public description of the professional services that this will provide for the URA. Thank you for your question. The uh, Professional services tonight is in relation to an IGA that was signed between the URA and Adams County uh, late 2022. It's basically the cost share to have a consultant come in and to do a blight study in the area around the 72nd light rail station. Uh, it's actually a very large study area. So because it's a joint study between the CCURA or the City of Commerce City in Adams County, it's about 12 to 1500 acres. So it's a very large area. They'll study all that area and they'll have a blight study that then we'll report back to the CCURA with to basically determine what the boundaries of a potential URA plan would be in the future. So what we get for this study is the blight study. Uh, that's phase one. Phase two is that they're going to do a market study to indicate what sorts of land uses and at what intensity might be supported around the rail station. 
Uh, then uh, item three is to help staff negotiate with the taxing entities to have uh, cost share or tax share agreements like we've done on other URA plans where they would uh, pledge a portion of their mill levy potentially for a project. And then the fourth task covered under this is to actually create an urban renewal plan for the city council to adopt uh, at a later date. We're anticipating that to be late 2023, early 2024. So would an urban renewal plan include, if, you, if we're discussing blight, we're looking at 1,500 acres. There are a lot of homes in that area. Are you saying that this plan would potentially uh, be eminent domain discussions for homes in that area? It'd be incredibly unlikely, and that would be a decision for the city and the URA at a later date on whether or not um, eminent domain would apply for a particular project. For land that it's included within the urban renewal plan, it's just simply a designation. It's an educational component that we have where we plan to talk to a lot of the property owners to explain what that means to be in an urban renewal plan. The only way that blight would be used, or the only way that eminent domain would be used is if there was a project that furthered the plan in the future. And at the time, the city or the URA uh, board determined that eminent domain was an appropriate step. Uh, historically, that is not a tool that the city and many cities through Colorado use. Okay, and what is the impact on their home value while this is occurring? So there's no impact at all to their home value while it's occurring or after the fact in the sense that there's no additional mill levy or uh, taxes. It simply relates to if a development project occurred after the plan was approved, so a year from now that it would be possible to negotiate with the private developer any increment. So if a developer came in and said, I'm gonna purchase this two acre lot that has a boarded up structure on it and build a, a retail facility, then he would create an increment that could be used to help facilitate that project. But just because increment is generated uh, does not mean that any of the surrounding properties will pay higher rates. So the, the mill levy, the sales tax, Nothing changes whatsoever whether or not a property is in a URA or not. Okay, and the increment is one of the tools under urban renewal. Yes, ma'am. So the increment, if, if an urban renewal plan is approved in this area, then the value between what it is today or what it is when the plan's approved and after a project is built where value is added, that gap in between whatever the city pledges to the URA, that can be used as an increment for a, a financing tool for, for development in the future. But um, so the process would be that if the contract's approved, uh, EPS would complete those four tasks and then it would be brought back to the city council to approve the URA plan. Uh, if the plan gets approved, then the CCURA takes that plan to implement over the next 25 years. So until that plan is approved, it is 100% uh, entirely a city council decision whether or not um, to carry forward with an urban renewal plan in that area. So this is all the work to get to that point. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Commissioner Douglas. Yes, thank you. So um, I, I'm kind of lost on the purpose for for doing this and, and uh, blighting this area. Um, to me, I have some real major concerns with it and how it might impact that area detrimentally. And, and so in hiring this consultant, the objective is to find a way to blight it, correct? <clears throat> Not necessarily uh, find a way to blight it. Um, if you're familiar with the properties that are the closest to the 72nd rail station, there are some, some lands over there. There's an old landfill that's directly next to it and some older industrial properties that likely would not be developed uh, through market conditions because there's a much higher level to go into an old landfill as we know with Sand Creek and convert it to something that's usable. Um, so it wouldn't create blight. What their first step is, is to go and actually physically do an inventory of all the properties and to give the report to the city that indicates of the 1,000 properties, 800 of them would be considered blighted or 600 or 200. And then that's what they would use to recommend an actual boundary for an urban renewal area. And, and so that number doesn't include, it does include residential properties. It does, it includes all land uses um, as well as rights of way and, and um, the, the river that cuts through the middle of it. Yes, ma'am. 
and, and so in doing so, this is to, to provide a plan for future development Am I correct? In that? Th that's correct. So we have a, a station area plan that the city's uh, community development department worked on about a decade ago. And Urban Land Institute came in and updated that over the last two or three years. And throughout that document, they kept talking about, you know, what sort of planning practices should be implemented. And both those documents mentioned that in order to facilitate that sort of development, it would likely require using urban renewal as a financial tool in the future. Mm -hmm. um, signalized intersections, road widenings, a bridge uh, over the 72nd rail station to the adjacent 80 acre property approximately that's a landfill, uh, that there's a lot of improvements that would benefit from having URA financing available later. Hmm. So with the, um, the low income apartments that are planned for that one segment of land, that's already been put in place. And it, it, it went against what the people in that area had wanted and had expressed their desires to see there. And, and so now I'm hearing expressions of discontent with something like that going in because that destroys all of their hope for what they had saw the potential to be there. And, and so I understand that, that the, the, this council wants to see housing available that's affordable. However, it's, it's like, <laughs> What I'm saying is that the developers are coming in and they're using this to their advantage and they're not actually providing uh, properties that are, are affordable for those who are struggling with, with uh, their income. And, and so with this being <coughs> such a large area, I, I don't know, I feel like this is really could backfire on us, and, and I have concerns about it. And I, I don't know what you can say to, to um, make me see this from a, a, a different perspective. You know, one of my major concerns is gentrification. And one of the ways that areas get gentrified is that the community members themselves get left out of the decision-making process. And, and so I can see that the possibilities to, to really put gentrification um, into full speed ahead is a possibility with this. And, and I, I just feel like there's, this is opening um, the floodgates. So. So, Commissioner Douglas, if I may uh, step in uh, to a couple of your points. The uh, urban renewal area study does not influence or impact the comprehensive plan or the long range plan or the zoning that is intact. Uh, the urban renewal plan, to Mr. Aiken's point, uh, presents a number of different tools at use by the um, urban renewal authority in support of mitigating gentrification, for instance, uh, some of the items that will be discussed for potential programmatic support of existing residential is to assist them uh, with various projects that currently under our existing models of the city government, we cannot partake in. Uh, we can also look at development without displacement programs uh, for residents that have uh, grown up there their entire life. So the urban renewal area plan will be able to provide greater access to tools in support of new development, but also in support of existing residential neighborhoods and the character uh, and the community appearance and beautification that exist. The things that will be critical to the URA will be the discussions of the council uh, when the comp plan comes forward as it 
outlines the long-term vision and the future around that. Like I said, the plan doesn't influence that. It doesn't control that. That is squarely within uh, the city's purview um, for that. Um, this will help to, once again, provide the funding resources for whatever that long-term vision is. All right, I <clears throat> have a motion and a second to approve resolution URA 2023-03. The title does not need to be read. We'll do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. The motion is going to carry... 11 to 1 to 1. 11 to 1 to 1. Thank you very much. All right, that is all the business that we have for the URA. Thank you, Ms. Lovato, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Machuga, Mr. Tedesco, for also being with us virtually. Appreciate everybody. This time, I will reconvene the City Council special meeting. And should we do the executive session first? Tough crowd tonight. <laughs> All right, Council. Does Council wish to identify the top three candidates on the first ballot? Yep. All right. Mr. Gibson, would you please provide a ballot so that City Council can vote for the top three applicants? Yes, sir, Mayor. And just as a um, uh, point of clarification, we will distribute the ballots. We will then collect the ballots. Then because Councilmember Kim is attending virtually, we'll have Councilmember Kim announce his uh, name and his vote uh, to be in line with Council Policy 21 and then read the paper ballots after Councilmember Kim has announced his vote. So I will distribute those now. Thank you. Vote for one or vote for three? Oh. Just so all the council members are aware, even though your ballot says to vote for one, you're voting for your three. Councilmember Kim, could you announce your three votes? Yes. Uh, first one is Ms. Renee Miller of Chacon. Secondly is Ms. Ashley Jackson. And my third is Ms. 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 Melinda Larson. Uh, Councilmember Madera, we have Michael Storosum. Ashley Jackson, and Jose Guardiola.
Councilmember Noble. Councilmember Noble, you have Melinda Larson, Ashley Jackson, and Renee Miller Chacon. Mayor Pro Tem Alan Thomas, Melinda Larson, Ashley Jackson, and Renee Miller Chacon. And Mayor Hughesman, we have Michael Sorosum, Melinda Larson, and Ashley Jackson. Councilmember Hurst, Melinda Larson, Ashley Jackson, and Jose Guardiola. Councilmember Ford. Council Ford, Michael Sterosum, Ashley Jackson, Jose Guardiola. And Council Member Douglas, Melinda Larson, Ashley Jackson, and Renee Miller Chacon. Top three vote getters for the first round of votes are Melinda Larson, Ashley Jackson, and Renee Miller Chacon. So I'll ask the clerk to eliminate Michael Sterosum and Jose Guardiola and distribute ballots for the top three candidates. Give us just a moment, Mayor, while we print new ballots, please. Mr. Hader, get up. Up there, sir. All right, before we um, distribute the next round of ballots, does anybody on council have a motion to make? OK, 
Okay, please distribute the ballot. Oh, Council Member Dare. Yeah, I guess um, I'll go ahead and make the motion. So in the first round we had um, one candidate that received unanimous uh, votes from everyone on council. So I'll make the motion to appoint Ashley Jackson to be the Ward 3 representative. I have a motion to appoint Ashley Jackson to serve in the Ward 3 council seat. Council Member Ford. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second to appoint Ashley Jackson to be the Ward 3 Council Member. Is there any discussion? Council Member Ford. No. Council Member Douglas. I will not be supporting this because um, I would like to see who is going to rise to the top. So I would like to, the next round is the top two, is that correct? Top three. The top three, Council Member Douglas. Oh. If they're voting for one, she's asking. Correct. Yes, you've narrowed it down to your top three and you will be voting for one on this second round. Right, okay, thank you. So I will not be supporting the motion. Council Member Noble. I won't be supporting it either because um, that would be ranked choice voting, which is not what uh, we agreed to. The agreement was that we would have our top three and then we would have our, and then we would vote for one. And so I will um, adhere to what we agreed to. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I just want, I won't be supporting it either. Thank you. Mayor Huseman, just as a point of clarification, uh, ranked choice voting is an option within Council Policy 21 if you wanted to move in that direction, and it's similar to what you just conducted for your first round, but not technically exactly the same, just point of clarification. Yes, except, excuse me, we had an agreement. We made an agreement at a previous council meeting as to how this was going to be handled tonight. That's what I'm referencing. If we want to change it going forward, then I'm perfectly happy to do that but not while we're midstream. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. All right, the motion and the second is to appoint Ashley Jackson to be the council member for Ward 3. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Nay. And that motion is going to fail three to five. Okay, please distribute the ballots. Council Member Kim, could you please announce your vote? Ms. Melinda Larson. Council Member Madera has Ashley Jackson. Council Member Noble has Renee Miller Chacon. Mayor Pro Tem has Renee Miller Chacon. Mayor Huseman, Melinda Larson. Council Member Hurst, Ashley Jackson. Council Member Ford, Ashley Jackson. And Council Member Douglas, Renee Miller Chacon. 
All right, we have two individuals who received three votes. One individual received two votes. Ms. Larson, thank you very much for applying. Unfortunately, you're not moving on to the next ballot. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gibson, will you please distribute another round of ballots? Yes, sir. Give us just a moment to reprint. Where's Mr. Aiken at? He didn't leave already, did he? He's not back there. He's gone. He's gone? He's departed. Oh, man. You already voted. <laughs> he should be able to get home before the second half starts. <laughs> Be quite surprised with the score. <laughs> well, I'm surprised to hear you say that, Councilmember Kim. I would think that 100% of your attention has been devoted to this council meeting, not to watching football games. <laughs> no comment at this time. I will have a discussion with the city attorney afterwards. <laughs> I'm sorry, Councilmember. I didn't. I didn't hear that. I was checking the score. Council Member Kim, could you announce your vote? Can you hear me? We can now, yes, sir. Ms. Renee Miller Chacon. Council Member Madera, Ashley Jackson. Council Member Noble, Renee Miller Chacon. Mayor Pro Tem, Alan Thomas. Renee Miller Chacon. Mayor Huseman, Renee Miller Chacon. Council Member Hurst, Ashley Jackson. Council Member Ford, Ashley Jackson. And Council Member Douglas, Renee Miller Chacon. All right, Ms. Miller Chacon has reached the threshold of five votes. Look for a motion and a second to appoint Renee Miller Chacon as the council member for Ward 3. Mayor Pro Tem. So moved. Councilmember Noble. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second to appoint Renee Miller Chacon as council member for Ward 3. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. If you'll come forward, please, for the swearing in. I'll up here. Yes. OK, 
Okay, if you'll raise your right hand, please. All right. I state your name. Renee Malarchakon. You're going to start with I. Oh, I, Renee Malarchakon. <laughs> Do swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States? Do swear and affirm that I support the Constitution and the laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the State of Colorado? The Constitution and laws of the State of Colorado. The Home Rule Charter and the Ordinances of Commerce City? The Home Rule Charter and the Home Rules of... Or, sorry. <laughs> the Home Rule Charter and the Ordinances and of the Commerce Ordinance City. And the Ordinances of Commerce City. I will faithfully perform the duties of the office. I will faithfully perform the duties of office. Of Council Member Ward 3 of the City of Commerce City, Colorado. Of Council... Of, <laughs> say it again, please. Of Council Member Ward 3 of the City of Commerce City, Colorado. Of Council Member Ward 3 of the City of Commerce City, Colorado. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, once again, I'd like to thank all the applicants that applied for this um, and uh, for your commitment to Commerce City and uh, hope that you'll consider running uh, for the special election that occurs in uh, November of this year, um, as well as everybody else that uh, has uh, two at-large council seats that are going to be available and um, Ward 4 and the mayor's seat as well will be available for election, as well as Ward 2. So quite a bit of seats on the uh, six out of nine seats will be available for election this year for uh, city council and hope that you all consider uh, throwing your hat in for that election process. Congratulations, Councilmember Miller Chacon, and uh, welcome to the City Council of Commerce City. At this time, I'm going to adjourn the special meeting of the City Council of Commerce City. And, oh, wait a minute. I was going to say, Mayor, I believe oh, we have an executive we're session. We're not adjourned. See, the, the script is all garbled up because it goes this way and that way and six ways from sideways. So now we have to have an executive session. So I'm looking for a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS sections 24-6-402, parentheses 4, sub parentheses F and G, for the purposes of discussing personal matters specifically related to the recruitment of a city attorney, discussing the interview process for the position of city attorney. Mayor Pro Tem. So moved. Council Member Madera. Second. I have a motion and a second to enter into executive session for the purposes stated. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries eight to one. I'm the no. We're, we're now going into executive session. The executive session is expected to last approximately 30 minutes, after which we'll come back out and uh, convene the study session. The meeting and broadcast recording are going to remain up for the fact that we're going to have a study session after this. However, City Council is not expected to take any action following the executive session that will require a vote. And Council Member Kim, we will be sending you an executive session link here in just a moment. Sounds good. I'll be on my email.
All right, uh, we are back from our executive session. No further business is going to be conducted in the special meeting of the City of Commerce City City Council, so we are going to adjourn to the study session. And we have uh, three presentations for the study session. First is the Second Creek Farm and Oasis Park. I'll invite Caroline Keith, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Golf, to introduce the presentation. Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, I'm here tonight to introduce the Second Creek Farm and Oasis presentation. In March of 2022, City Council allocated funding for the Second Creek Farm Neighborhood Park, and in May, allocated funding for a park near the Buffalo Highlands neighborhood, currently referred to as the Oasis. Um, an RFP for the design of both parks was posted in June of 2022. Two responses were received and evaluated, and a notice of intent to award was sent to Galloway in August of 2022. For 40 years, Galloway has been a nationally recognized industry leader. They are the only design firm in the industry providing a full spectrum approach. This approach utilizes a unique multidisciplinary mindset to create better project outcomes. The Park, Recreation, and Golf Department appreciates the opportunity to work with Galloway, the Galloway team, and community members, specifically Hillary, Le Hillary Leach, um, who has been instrumental in promoting uh, our public outreach and the online survey. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce to you all John Romero with Galloway. Good evening, council members, Mayor Huseman, and newly elected council members. Um, I'm John Romero. I'm the landscape architecture and planning team manager for Galloway. Uh, with me tonight, I have Dave Foster, who is the project manager on this project, uh, Heather Vidlock, who's our development services coordinator, um, Bryn Halston, who is our landscape architect, and Phil Dalrymple, who is on our civil team. <clears throat> As Carolyn had mentioned, we were contracted to do the work for the Second Creek and Oasis Park farm sites. Um, our specific role is to do the site analysis, site selection, public outreach, and design of the two neighborhood parks for Oasis and Second Creek. <clears throat> Above are the areas of the two park sites that we are currently studying that will <clears throat> serve as the design areas for the future design concepts. Part of our project scope early on in where we're at currently is the early analysis of the sites. We, between Oasis and Second Creek, are looking at access, amenities, circulation, connections, um, drainage, floodplain, the neighborhoods, a whole slew of things. So we're still in that early analysis phase, but we're doing that with both Oasis and Second Creek as we're moving forward. Oasis Park, as you um, some are familiar with, is just south of 96, East 96th Avenue, next to the Buffalo Highlands neighborhood. Um, this is the current study area with a potential park area for about one to two um, acres of park improvements. Oasis Park um, currently has about one neighborhood access to it, just east uh, next to the Buffalo Highlands site. There are four neighborhoods that intersect uh, Oasis Park or within a 10 minute walk. 75% uh, of that site is within a floodplain. Uh, there are two types of wetlands in there that are both emergent and riparian, and they're present throughout the Second Creek Corridor and Oasis Park site. You can see the Second Creek Corridor kind of flanks us to the north and the south. Uh, we did look at very early on this five minute, 10 minute walk, understanding that access is kind of important to that and understanding what that means for the neighborhoods adjacent. Second Creek Farm Park is next to the Second Creek Farm neighborhood. Uh, the limits of improvement in there are approximately 10 acres with two acres of that for a drainage area um, that are potentially limiting the development. There is a future school site to the south. Second Creek Farm Park is, has two neighborhoods that intersect the site within about 10 minutes. It is adjacent to the proposed schools with three potential access points to the park. Um, one of those potential, and there is one potential access to Second Creek Trail which is with future, with future uh, projects. Um, as we kind of started on this project, we wanted to look at kind of 
how we move this forward and how we, how we engage the community. That's a key to ask of what we came in to do and when we presented ourselves for, the, for this project. Um, with this in the very beginning, we wanted to kind of start understanding the community and presented, um, met with Parks Department, had an early kickoff meeting and talked a little bit about approach. From that, we presented an early newsletter, um, created a city capital projects website, and then just recently conducted an open house on December 6th. Um, with that, we paired an in, in, uh, online version of that open house, which had a visual preference survey, um, along with the online version too. Uh, so far to date, we've had about 30 plus community members attended the open house. Uh, we were provided 518 responses and comments to the visual preference survey, um, both uh, for the in-person version. We had 100 plus community members that provided about 2,000 responses and com comments to the online visual preference survey. Um, with that, we conducted um, what we call the word cloud. The word cloud was really just to give an idea of what's the theme, what's the kind of mantra that you'd want for these different sites, just to kind of start to gather some ideas and theming and presence for those parks. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to pass this on to Dave Foster that will tell you a little bit about next steps. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about the community engagement piece a little bit more. Um, when we first came on, one of the key things that we heard from staff was just understanding the importance that council had um, in regards to engaging the community. So throughout our process, Dave will explain a little bit more the other, option, other times that we'll have opportunity for council to participate and the neighborhood to participate in the design process. Um, with that, it was really important to kind of understand what are the needs for the park, what are the desires for the neighborhood, and what's most important. Um, in coupling that with the analysis that we've gathered today and understanding where you know, the constraints are, where the advantages are to the sites, and what are the things in the project givens that we need to evaluate as we move into design. We have not yet <clears throat> moved into design just for kind of um, context. We're still in the kind of early analysis, engagement piece, and have a couple other phases that Dave will kind of talk to you about here moving forward. And with that, I'll bring Dave up, and then we'll answer questions afterwards. Which one is it? Yep. Okay. All right. Good evening. I'm Dave Foster with Galloway. I'm the project manager for this project. I'll be carrying this project uh, from the public engagement phase into design development, construction documents, and eventual construction of the park sites. Uh, as John has mentioned, um, we've built in multiple opportunities for public engagement on this project to solicit feedback and direction uh, how we want to develop these parks, um, as well as uh, check-in points with City Council and the Parks, Recreation, and Golf um, um, Council. Uh, I think we're at a very good place right now. We, uh, as John had mentioned, we just completed the open house and the online visual preference survey. Uh, we've uh, received a very um, substantial and favorable uh, response from the community. And this will provide us the direction moving into the design development phase. Uh, the next steps uh, are to develop um, two uh, conceptual alternatives for each park, Oasis and Second Creek, and uh, pre uh, present those to the community to solicit additional feedback and direction on uh, further development of the designs for the parks. Uh, the next step will be uh, to develop from that input uh, one uh, design presentation for each park, one conceptual alternative where we'll uh, solicit additional feedback from the community, from council, and from the um, Parks, Recreation, and Golf Committee. Uh, from that stage, we will further develop the uh, designs to a 60% um, uh, level where we'll come back and present to city council and uh, solicit any feedback before we go into the construction document phase of the projects. From that point, um, Oasis and uh, Second Creek won't track exactly the same. Oasis is, uh, has been conveyed to us by uh, staff that uh, that is a priority between these two parks. 
So we'll start taking Oasis into a uh, construction document phase a little bit before we go into the Second Creek construction documents. Uh, Second Creek will trail a little bit behind that, but uh, it is our understanding that Oasis is the priority for uh, development of these two parks. We are looking at uh, fourth quarter of uh, 23 to award the contract and um, begin mobilizing for construction on Oasis. And then the first quarter for completing uh, construction documents for Second Creek and awarding uh, the construction contract and moving into construction. So that's an overall uh, view of um, next steps for the project. Um, and I think that is the end of our presentation. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that presentation, the update on the timeline. Does anybody on council have any questions? Councilmember Noble. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, and uh, thank you for meeting with all the residents previously. Uh, because study sessions uh, don't allow public to, the public to speak, um, I ask uh, the residents in Buffalo Highland to let me know what questions they had after looking at this presentation. So I represent this area. Okay. As does everyone, but the, I specifically am word for it. Understood. Um, Apparently, there might have been some misunderstanding about uh, commitment to start time. Uh, so was it more aggressive and it's slowed down now compared to what was discussed with residents that night? We'll, we'll, let, we'll let Carolyn speak to that a little bit. But from what our understanding was is initially when this RFP came out, it was for Second Creek Farm being the priority. But then we shifted after discussions with council that Oasis was the priority. So we've kind of shifted and moved our efforts to Oasis. Right, uh, uh, they were under the impression that uh, the commitment was to begin moving dirt in spring of uh, this year. Uh, Council Member Noble, this is the first time that we've provided any specific timeline. So I, I'm not aware of any commitment that we've made uh, I don't believe that we made any commitments at the, the public open house that we had at Buffalo or Bison Ridge. Um, so I'm happy to talk with whomever may have. Uh, it was uh, the person that you mentioned earlier, Hillary, Hillary okay. Leach. Mm -hmm. I can follow up with her. Yeah, and also uh, Council Member Kim was at the meeting, so perhaps he has a recollection as okay. well. Um, if he's still, oh, he's still with us. There he yeah, is. Yeah, he's up there. Hi there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when will we actually, so we aren't really seeing all of the ideas that everyone had that evening. We're not, where, what's happening to all those ideas that were on the multiple boards? I got there later and people had, uh, made choices and made recommendations and so forth, and we're not seeing those. So the next step in our process, now that we've gathered all the community feedback, is to kind of analyze that, bring that to you, present all those information that we've received from the online survey and the open house engagement, and show you how those serve as direction for the concepts. So before we get into 30%, we want to bring those design schematics very early on, bring all that information, present it to you, present what we've heard, and then present the analysis as part of that too to show how we're shaping the next steps. And the, the piece that I would add to that, so Galloway summarized all of the comments mm -hmm. from the public outreach meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, our staff summarized and provided all of the comments from the online survey to uh, Galloway. I've received some email requests and, and information that I have also forwarded to Galloway. So that, as John has said, will be presented later, but the information's available. Okay, because um, they were also under the impression that they would be given a 60% view by this point and that there would be some renderings by now. Uh, I, 
wasn't communicated at the open house, so, so I apologize if that was misunderstood, but the next steps is, again, to gather all this information, put together some early concepts, and then represent the information based on what we have to date. Okay. Well, then I think that um, a conversation is definitely in order to make certain that everybody's on the same page Absolutely. regarding this. I mean, I appreciate that, that uh, you're working on it. I appreciate that it has been um, um, fast-tracked, if you will, uh, before Second Creek. But um, we, all, we need to get the neighborhood on the same page because otherwise we're not making uh, strides when it comes to working with the community if they're under an entirely different impression. Yeah. Okay, maybe, thank you. I don't know, maybe Carolyn, you want to speak to what was the precipice for OASIS versus some of the misunderstandings or the PUD, how that came about and how maybe there yeah, was, no, okay. I, I think so we can certainly follow up with, uh, I'm gonna say I'll, I'll reach out to Hillary and we'll set up something. Um, we'll also, we didn't want to publish this proposed information as to the timeline for next steps until we talk to council. And I think part of what we've tried to do, we actually have more outreach meetings scheduled for this process than what we have done in the past because we felt that council had given us direction to make sure we were including the public and getting their input with the steps along the way. So we, it is taking us a little bit more time to have those additional meetings to make sure that we're really getting what folks want to see in those parks. So we, we've got an extra outreach piece in there. Okay, how many people attended the first outreach? 30-ish. Um, yep. And then we had at least 100 folks do the online survey, which yeah, that's, that's really- That's by far has been better than most of the online surveys we've had. I would agree with you there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Douglas. Thank you, Mayor Huseman. Um, in reference to slide six uh, regarding the floodplain uh, for Oasis, that's 75%. That's, that's the major part of it. Yeah. Um, are you going to be doing anything special to address that? And I, I know we we had to look at different parts of the neighborhood and where we could put a park there because they were promised the park and yeah. and you know I I think staff on on taking those extra measures and really uh, engaging with the the community members to make this happen and and so I I definitely. I'm happy with that portion of it. Uh, so I understand the location because I've been involved with this from the very start of uh, the, the community members coming forward to say, where's our missing park? And what are you gonna do about it? And we have done something about it. However, 75% of it is in a floodplain. Yep. And you know, maybe being the realtor that I am, floodplains kind of, <laughs> scare me a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things. Um, Galloway, as Carolyn had mentioned, is a full spectrum firm. We came to the table with civil engineers, water resource managers, and even some environmental aspects to it too. Um, part of that study, understanding the space is key. And so that's why today we're presenting some of the the process of what we're going through mm -hmm. prior to moving forward too fast and saying, hey, here's the design, right? So part of that process is understanding the, the watershed in there, the floodplain, and how much developable area we have. And it definitely will impact the design that we have forthcoming. But based on what we've seen so far, there's still about one to two acres of space potentially that we can develop. Um, but as we get into that, the key is to kind of keep the floodplain intact, make sure that we're proposing things that make sense for that area, that try to kind of hit on the marks that the neighborhood has presented and talked about at the open house. We got really great feedback at the open house and online about what the hopes are. 
Um, but then prior to going to the open house, it was important to us to bring some of this information to the neighborhood to say, hey, these are, these are the givens, right? We understand that, that there's a lot of space there, but there's constraints. There's things that we have to deal with and understand to, get to, to make sure that we meet those needs of the park. Um, again, it goes into even, and we'll get more in depth on this when we come into the, fir the uh, first uh, presentation, the initial design concepts. Talk about what those things mean to these designs. Like, how, what's access like? How far do you have to walk to get there? How far do you feel safe sending your kids to walk there? Um, what are the challenges we have from grading, from drainage, those types of things? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the key things that we think is important here is diversity. Diversity in these parks and the park system from talking to staff and from the neighbor, neighbors is important. Having things that are different in each park, not going to a park and having the same opportunities and amenities. So that was a key thing in those um, visual preference surveys and in open house. So I uh, had the opportunity to visit Enro, and as you're going into the site, they have built like park areas over the drainage that's there. That I mean, it's really cool because it makes it usable. And so I'm wondering if you're going to be doing anything like that. And we have a lot, a lot of drainage areas yeah. uh, in the north, particularly. Um, would love to see something like that in in some of those drainage areas that an I to me are an eyesore right now. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we could we could talk about that later on for other, sure. <laughs> for yeah. other areas. The, the key thing is just making sure we don't disturb the base flood elevations in there, because when you do have those 100 year storms, it's important that those can convey those flows. So that'll be a part of those studies based on what we've received feedback wise from the community so far. Buffalo Highlands was very active and it was great to sit there and talk to everybody. So it was really good interaction in person. Very good, I appreciate everything. Uh, I had one more quick question, and you may not have the answer to this, but what is the school that's going to be next to Second Creek Farm Park? I don't believe that's been determined yet, 100%. I think there is some progress on that, though. It, it appears that there is a uh, public charter school that is looking at the lot to the south of our uh, Second Creek Park site. Okay, thank you so much for all of the information. Appreciate it. Councilmember Kim. Yeah, so I do remember uh, you guys being there and actually uh, discussing with the with the residents uh, as to as to what that uh, you know just obtaining their feedback essentially. I don't know if I heard this um, correctly or not, but uh, based off the feedback that was received, whether it was a virtual online or even in person, with the montage of you know different areas. Um, did you say that that would be brought forward again at some point to residents and also to council to, yep. to view? Yes, absolutely. So the next step for us is to gather this information, which we've gathered, present that information in a way that's tangible and digest, easy for you to digest. We want to get in there, look at kind of how the responses came back, what we heard, what they said about amenities, what they said about theming, accessibility, um, who the park should serve. That was a key question. Who should this park serve in these communities? Bring that all back and let you know what the neighborhood said and the community said. Copy that. And then the other the other question I had too was regarding the name of the park. Um, I believe uh, I, I know I think Ms. Carolyn and I we had a discussion regarding that. Um, I, I don't know if the name of the park is actually set in stone. Is do we do we know this? Council Member Kim, the name is not set in stone, uh, and what we shared with the group at the public outreach meeting was that we do have a policy in place for the naming of park and recreation amenities, which would include parks. Um, I would imagine with the Oasis, the Buffalo Highland neighborhood uh, area park that we're looking at, we'd probably look to that neighborhood. We, you know, we haven't made a determination. Um, we've done contests in the past where uh, residents have made recommendations for names. Uh, the policy then calls for those to be vetted through the Park Recreation and Golf Advisory Committee, and ultimately the recommendation comes to City Council uh, for final approval. 
But honestly, I don't know where Oasis came in along the process. That's just what somehow it got dubbed, and that's what we've been calling it. But I don't anticipate that will be the long-term name of the park. Thank you very much, Carolyn. And I think to what uh, Councilmember Noble had said earlier, um, I think with regards to the, the timelines that was pro provided, what was provided tonight is what I recall from the actual uh, meeting uh, that occurred uh, with, with the residents. So um, the idea of, of it happening, uh, I think in spring or so, I, I don't recall that piece. So, but thank you for the presentation as well. Really appreciate you bringing this back up. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Councilmember Noble. Thank you very much. I have an answer on Oasis because that was me. <laughs> um, I had only said the word Oasis in terms of a concept, that it was strictly the concept of being on this long sort of barren trail and that it would be an Oasis <laughs> just uh, south of, of 96. And that was the thought process that went behind it. It had nothing to do with naming it. It was more... Uh, the, the thought of what the concept could be for that for that kind of area. And it was part of my pitch to win the 2K money in order to get this park put in. So yes, please, <clears throat> neighbors, choose choose a choose a name that works best for you in city. That that would be fine. It's strictly generic. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from City Council? Thank you all, appreciate it. Look forward to seeing the work that you accomplish. Thank you, appreciate right. your time. We're gonna move on to impact fee presentations. I'll invite our city manager, Jason Rogers, to introduce the presentations. Thank you, sir. Um, first and foremost, I thought you, I'd share, share with you all that um, you all will notice the agenda was updated this afternoon with uh, more information as it pertained to your direction in uh, identifying which land uses would not be imposed the roadway or drainage, drainage way impact fee. Uh, I wanted to share with you that we experienced some significant software and technical issues with the upload of those documents uh, to which we have an inquiry into uh, our vendor as to why we experienced that, we're, but we're finally able to provide that to you and to the community. What that means is obviously we pride ourselves to make sure that you all have this information in a timely fashion. Um, to none of our efforts, we weren't able to accomplish that. You have it now. Um, and obviously we can go through a presentation for you all, but I don't know if you all have had the opportunity to be able to truly review and digest and prepare appropriate questions or comments that you may have. So understanding that I wanted to present a couple of options to you for uh, your deliberation and direction back to us. One, we can always kick this to the January 23rd meeting uh, and allow for that conversation to occur while you all have this information. Um, I think the other option is we can take this item to a uh, regular meeting for it to be a ordinance for your discussion, deliberation, and action. Um, you may recall that we've had three to four previous meetings over the course of the year. And with each passing moment, there are certain impact fees that we are leaving on the table. You all asked us to go and to determine, can we look at a more specific imposition of the fee based on the data or the report that was presented to you? Yes, we can. Can staff identify which ones we believe will meet the expectations set by our council in our meeting in October? Yes, we have. So my recommendation would be, I think we have spent uh, a good amount of discussion, and I would say worthwhile discussion on getting to this stage of what's before you. I think we're now at a point where we have to start taking some action and getting that information out into our community so that they know what to anticipate or to expect as they continue to develop here in our city. So with that, my recommendation would be, let's move to the next step of crafting an ordinance 
for our first reading on the February 6th agenda based on uh, staff's work on identifying the commercial uses, industrial and residential to be charged certain fees. Hey, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Any uh, commentary from city council regarding the proposal made by Mr. Rogers? Go forth and prosper. Thanks, sir. All right, that concludes our presentations for our study session. We'll move on to reports. City Manager Rogers. Thank you, sir. Uh, staff is still attempting, out of the city manager's office, staff is still attempting a meeting with Suncor to discuss the ramifications of the shutdown and the impacts on our community. Um, that being said, we are in dialogue with the Department of Local Affairs uh, in regards to assistance that might be provided to impacted residents that work for Suncor once we have those details. We are also exploring, uh, given that this may be a prolonged shutdown and there's other questions that obviously our community will have. How do we communicate that information as we become aware of it out? And we'll be developing a, a, a comprehensive strategy around that. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that as we receive it here to share not only with you all, but also with the community. Uh, just as a note, I have a meeting with the Adams County Health Department uh, leadership next week. Um, obviously, this is to begin establishing a, rela a relationship with our newly minted uh, health, health department and hopefully being able to see how we partner on various items going forward. Uh, it's my intent, I would and hope that we would be able to have the health department come before our council uh, to make a presentation in the near future about their mission, their vision, and how they plan to support Commerce City uh, as a community. As you are also aware, we have a meeting next week on excuse me, a, an item on the 23rd uh, with the fire district. Uh, they are, will be coming back before you all uh, to present additional information uh, from when they spoke last in regards to EV charging stations and things to be considered within the International Building Code for adoption when that comes back to you in the February timeframe. Coming out of community development, uh, last week, across two days, uh, our code enforcement uh, division issued 71 notice of violations in regards to snow removal within our sidewalks. Uh, it appears as our, our staff has engaged the various um, property owners in which those NOVs were issued, that some expected there would be a quick warm up and that the sun would be able to melt the problem. Uh, obviously, that did not occur with the extreme weather that we had. So we are working with the community relations uh, on how to push out notices to the community, uh, in particularly when uh, I declare that when the snow has melted, uh, when their period of 24 hours has started to clear those sidewalks and to what level of clearing we are looking for, uh, even though it's not necessarily stated within our ordinances. Generally speaking, at the end of last year, uh, I think we did a rather, uh, we had a rather robust development and growth. Uh, once again, for the year, we issued 1,092 certificate of occupancies for new residential. Uh, that's still much higher than even some of our fastest paced years of, of recent. We had almost 40,000 building inspections. We had almost 20,000 open cases for code enforcement closed within the calendar year. Uh, so a lot of activity uh, pertaining to that. Coming out of public works, uh, we had, uh, we received word that approximately 4 million in funding for the 62nd Avenue and Vasquez Boulevard, uh, which was applied through the congressional funding uh, has been approved. Uh, so the FY23 appropriations bill by Congress uh, has been signed into law and should be received, released, excuse me, from the Federal Highway Administration early this year. Uh, some of you all may have noticed that we have also just recently published a request for bids on the South Lawn Elementary School signage improvements. Uh, that project will include installation of a flashing beacon, speed radar sign, and school, school sign 
school zone signage, excuse me. Uh, 96th Avenue, uh, work is continuing on that matter for uh, full build out. A uh, site walk was scheduled for the first week of January, but due to weather, uh, that was to re happen this Thursday. Our staff has engaged a, a handful of residents if they would like to join us on that site walk uh, to understand how that design process will move forward. Also, there will be an item coming before uh, the council to recognize uh, the city's work on the span wire signal. Uh, given that the emergent nature of the vehicular conflicts that we were experiencing for that section, we took immediate action to procure. So we simply will bring that forward to once again keep you all in the loop. Uh, in regards to the I-270 corridor improvement updates, this is the larger project that spans uh, Commerce City, Adams County, and the city and county of Denver. Uh, there is a discussion at the state and federal level as to whether or not they would like to do a full EIS um, for that section of the roadway, and that's a full environmental Im impact statement. Uh, given the stage that where we are at at this project, uh, by doing such would add an additional two years to the project scope and timeline. I bring this up is that because council may want to have CDOT and or its project management team to come before and give a more comprehensive, robust update, given that the last one that occurred was well over two and a half years ago um, before this body. So it may be due just once again to bring you all full tilt on where things stand and where things are going and to still provide that necessary feedback on behalf of the community. Side note, as of last week, we had mulched 213 Christmas trees. Um, to me, that stands out because that's a lot of Christmas trees, but coming out of the Christmas holiday. Uh, why that's also important is that, as you all have noticed, our cardboard recycling containers continue to experience heavy use. Uh, last week, we spent, over t uh, spent a considerable time of <coughs> emptying out those overflow bins and hauling cardboards out. We actually filled six one-ton dump trucks um, full of cardboard just in the span of last week, and they still remain in heavy use. Uh, staff is looking into alternative solutions with respect to that. Uh, we have repaired uh, various traffic signs and, and, and potholes. Potholes have been uh, a difficulty during the cold weather. Obviously, uh, can't use hot mix or using cold mix, but as you all know, when you are plowing a street and you put that shovel in the ground, you're going to pick up where you had already patched. So we are going back and fix, fixing patches, and hopefully as the weather starts to get a little bit hot, warmer, we can try to get those down from an interim into a longer, longer term fix. And with that, that concludes my update for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Anybody on council have any questions for the city manager? Seeing none, we'll move on to Mr. Hader, our interim city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's not a lot I wanted to, um, to mention tonight, but I did want to share with you just a couple of items. Um, you will notice that on our, our January 23rd meeting, we have invited outside council to do a presentation, a public presentation um, with regards to um, Suncor. Um, and this is outside council that's in, been involved in um, our air quality efforts. Um, this is the same council that, that previously submitted our notice of intent to file a, a lawsuit um, against Suncor. Um, and of course, um, they'll be able to address you and to get our newer council members up to speed on that history and, and some build that familiarity and background there. Um, and of course, there's been a lot happening with Suncor recently in our community. And to the extent they're able to, and we have some information we can we can share with you what we what we might learn between now and then as well. Um, in the between now and then, if there's anything that you want to make sure gets included in that presentation, please feel free to reach out so I can talk to outside counsel so we can get that information in that public presentation. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we, we always invite public to, to view those meetings and, and be present at that meeting so they know the history and what's going on there as well, because that's a very big um, part of the community and part of our economy and, and part of our um, concerns as well. Um, that being said, I will also encourage you all to watch your emails in the next couple of days. There are some confidential um, matters that have um, come up that I would be advising you of um, through an attorney-client privileged communication. 
Um, so we will now be updating our email list to welcome our new council member as well. So you can look for those emails um, this week as well. Um, or at least that, those, there's at least one email I'm really thinking of. Um, other than that, there's nothing else I can think of that um, I need to make you aware of at this time. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Mr. Hader. Does anybody on council have any questions for the interim city attorney? Thank you again. Does anybody on council wish to make a report? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to let everyone know on January 5th, um, Thursday, last Thursday, I attended the Meet Your City Council with the Commerce City Chambers of Commerce at the Bison Grill, and it was a real nice event and got to meet, meet the businesses that are members and meet the current board members for the Commerce City of Chambers. And then also, um, this past Saturday, I had the honor of attending with my father, um, former Mayor Casey Hayes and his wife, Mary Ann Hayes, um, 60th wedding anniversary celebration. And that was a really neat event because that's rare these days to see someone celebrating 60 years of a happy and blessed marriage. And that's all I have in my report. Thank you. Council Member Noble. Um, I attended the same chamber event as Mayor Pro Tem Alan Thomas. It was quite lovely at, uh, at Bison Grill at Buffalo Run. Also, we had a meeting of the Policy and Governance Committee. We have a lot on our plate, and so there will be uh, yet another meeting this month as uh, we try to move through um, the items. Also, I want to point out that um, even though uh, the term shutdown has been used regarding Suncor, uh, people are going to be seen flaring. Um, there will still be um, emissions because of what they're, they're doing. Um, it's, all, it's all part of the process. There is product that is in all of these pipelines. There's product that is in the tanks. So you can't just like flip a switch. It doesn't work that way. So um, please keep that in mind. It is not, as the Denver Post said, technically a shutdown, but it is a sort of slowing down, shutting down while they, while they fix some, th some things. Um, I think that's very important to keep in mind. And, and there may, may be more air emissions that we need to be keeping, keeping track of. I know that Cultivando is, um, is stepping up their, um, their uh, efforts as well to keep an eye on uh, the Suncor area during this, this three month period. And um, that's all I need to say on that subject. Thank you. Council Member Douglas. Thank you, Mayor Huseman. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome our new council member, um, Council Member Millard Chacon, and uh, congratulations to you and, and welcome. I know that you're going to be a, a fabulous addition to this council. Um, I would have loved to have attended all of the events of the last week, but managed to get ourselves snowed in in. Uh, South Dakota with the the um, horrible ice storm that came our way, uh, but I would have liked to have been able to attend those events and didn't get to. Um, with the uh, explosion at Suncor, I think we need to also remember that there were two people who were seriously injured in that explosion. and. People take their lives into their own hands going to work in a, a dangerous place such as the refinery every day that they go. And we have to remember um, the sacrifice that those people take and make in working a dangerous job to supply the rest of us with the comforts and the benefits that uh, um, we take for granted in a lot of ways. So. I just want those families to know that the city is concerned about their welfare and um, that they, they are in our thoughts in what has happened there. So it's not, not just a shutdown. There were people who were physically injured 
and they're probably still um, <coughs> mending from, from those injuries and uh, realize that uh, working in a refinery is a, a very dangerous job. And that's all I have, thank you. Any other reports? All right, I uh, would like to again congratulate Councilmember Lard Chacon for your appointment. Look forward to working with you for the next 10 months or so. Um, no council meeting next week in uh, honor and observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I um, would like to hope that everybody finds time in their day in order to make it a day of service in, in memory of uh, his sacrifice and his uh, beliefs and messaging to our nation as we uh, try to be better every day. Have a good night. Have a good couple of weeks. See you on January 23rd.